Okay. Good morning, students of the Word. I want to welcome you all uh, who are joining me here during the live video. And also those who might be viewing the uh, online video. Uh, let a, if you wouldn't mind, leave a comment. Let us know you got to see this. Um, heartfelt and profuse thank you for doing the class for me last week. It's great to be meeting back in the building again. And for all of our classes, not just the uh, one session. I hope you uh, are taking advantage of the Thursday evening. I think it's usually Thursday. Sometimes it switches around. The double D session, um, Benny and Darren, on Thursdays. Uh, I think they do a great job. You know, it's, uh, I love listening, hearing the encouraging words, the knowledge, the humor. Um, the banter. Yeah, the, <laughs> the banter, right, as Mark says. Uh, let me know if you can't hear us, and I don't know if anybody's checking to see us. If, Tony, if you wouldn't mind checking to make sure that uh, we're coming through okay. Well, that was number one that kept me out last Sunday, so number two is coming up April 1, so we'll see how that goes. Denny's class last week wasn't videoed, and so those of you who were here got in on a private showing private viewing, however you want. When I led class last, uh, it was online, and we start out with a lengthy, lengthy review because I had not been able to have class for a number of weeks due to uh, complications from the virus. Uh, and we're studying spiritual gifts that are given to grow and to mature the church when they are exercised by the members. We're looking right now at the spiritual gift of pastor slash uh, shepherd slash overseer slash elder. A few translations also use the word bishop. I think that was probably, well, a few translations. I refer to the passage in John 10, 1 through 18, for our reference point regarding, or one of our reference points, Regarding this spiritual gift, so if you wouldn't mind turning there, John 10, we will read that together. One, the first 18 verses. And I'll have you read that if you don't mind, Jody. John 10, 1 through 18. Truly, truly, I say to you, the one who does not enter by the door into the sheep, into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, he is a thief and a robber. Who's talking? It's in red, so it'd be you who's talking. Yes. Thank you. But the one who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the door, the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep listen to his voice. And he calls his own sheep by his name and leads them out. When he puts all his own sheep outside, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. However, a stranger they simply will not follow, but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of a stranger. Jesus told them this, fig told them this figure of speech, but they did not understand what the things he was saying to them meant. So Jesus said to them again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All those who come before me are thieves and robbers. The sheep do not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I come so that they would have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters the flock. He flees because he is a hired hand and does not care about the I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it back. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down of my own. 
I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it back. This commandment I receive from my Father. Okay. Last week we talked some about why this spiritual gift is called shepherd or shepherding. And because as Jesus points out, one of the roles of being a shepherd is to serve as a guardian, a gatekeeper against what? And what are wolves? Evil ones. Okay. And yes, they are. And they would be predators because they were bringing in something other than the truth, right? Because Jesus said, I'm the truth. And he said, I'm, I'm the doorway. So one of the roles of shepherd is to prevent false doctrine from entering, from infecting the flock. And in performing this task, I stress the duty of the one with this gift to know the guidebook so that he can recognize teaching that's not in the guidebook. You study a text and study a text and it becomes well-worn and you've seen many Bibles back when all of us were using books as opposed to electronic books. The pages were, I mean, my dad... Some of his old Bibles, he knew pretty much about where on the page it was and about where it was. He could almost, I mean, the, the pages are worn, they're stained, they're lined. You got words underlined and notes on the side. You know the guidebook. Well, that doesn't sound like it's in the guidebook. I don't think, where is that found? You see what I'm saying? You don't have to study everything else if you know the guidebook. And you know it inside and out, then you recognize right away that's not in there. That is not part of the text. So the shepherd is to serve as a guardian or a gatekeeper of the truth. And this knowledge is, is knowing the book, but I also discussed how wisdom must be applied, must be used in application. Of the knowledge, and you remember we talked about the Pharisees who had knowledge, but they didn't have the wisdom that went with the knowledge to recognize that this is God in front of them. And so they were called hypocrites by Jesus in Matthew 23. He said, You're not entering in, and you're keeping everybody else from entering in. So they were false shepherds. They were wolves because they were introducing or at least standing in the way of those who wanted to come to the truth. Having wisdom allows a shepherd to separate tradition and practice which are often instituted by men, although there are godly traditions, aren't there? What's a godly tradition? What's something that... Pardon? Prayer before meals. Okay. Okay. It could be a tradition. I mean. Right. That meeting every first day of the week, right? That's a godly tradition. That's something we do. That's a tradition. That's something we hold as a right, as a matter of fact, to meet and worship our Lord. That's a godly tradition. Not all traditions and practices are of God, some are of men, and wisdom helps the shepherd separate what is from men and what are the truth and requirements that came from God. And this helps keep them from doing as the Pharisees did, what they do, make the burdens too heavy to be borne because they added all their men's traditions on the backside. And that's called discernment. Exactly. Wisdom, discernment, yes. The second duty I highlighted is the duty to lead the flock to good pastures. Now, this was back before the days of so many fences. They did have rock walls and so forth, but they would, the shepherds were what we would call, well, one word that comes to mind is peripatetic, but 
They wandered around. They led their sheep to where the water was good, where the pasture was good. And in, in the book of Heidi, you see the, the shepherd taking the sheep up higher and down lower and so forth, depending on what time of year it is and where the pastures were. So the second duty is the duty to lead the flock to good pastures to provide abundant spiritual food so the members will not only grow, but will mature um, from milk to meat. And I cited uh, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 3, 2, where Paul's talking about they uh, aren't maturing. And the writer of Hebrews in 5, Hebrews 5, 11 through 14. And so in performing this second duty, we understand that the overseer has to be able to teach. Right? If he couldn't teach, how could he share scriptural knowledge with the flock to mature them? And thirdly, while the shepherd guards against invaders and instructs the flock so it grows and matures, he is also watching the progress of each member. Um, those of you, uh, I, there aren't too many sheep down in this area. At least I've not seen very many. Up where I was in southern Iowa, there were, there were a number of flocks of sheep. And you would have either a, a tag in the ear. But if you knew your sheep, you knew them as individuals. I knew old Greedy. And you can figure out how she got that name. There was Dolly. And there was the Suffolk. And, you know, we could go on. Uh, they each had their own personality, and the shepherd knows, watches the progress. Is, is, is Greedy getting her food? Yeah, she always gets her food, right? If, but is she growing? Is she maturing? Um, is this one over here, is this little smaller sheep, is that one the new, are they getting to the trough? Are they growing? Are they, where are they? They're not even here. And so he's overseeing the whole flock. And, and if there's one straggling or one that's wandered away from the protection of, because they're, they're strength in numbers, from the protection of the group, um, Christ talks about that the shepherd might even need the group to go get that one and try to bring it back. And all the while, he is recognizing that he is accountable for the flock. He doesn't own the flock because that right belongs to the chief shepherd who purchased each member with his blood. As Paul tells the Ephesian elders in Acts 20, 28, he says that you, you look over the sheep, but the chief shepherd is the one that you'll be answering to. And so as we look at the role of the overseer, we'll, we'll start out here with Peter's words in 1 Peter 5, um, 3 through 4. Where Peter says, do not be like a ruler over people you are responsible for, but be good examples to them. What do we hear? Lead by what? Example, exactly. Then when Christ, the chief shepherd, comes, you'll get a glorious crown that will never lose its beauty. In the following two verses in Acts 20. Um, that I quoted there after verse 28. Um, Paul provides some warnings that give us perspective into the dark side of the gift that we won't discuss at this time, but we'll come back to those when we're ready to talk about that. Let's think a little bit about this uh, concept of overseer. Um, it's a... It's, it has the shepherd part in it, but an overseer, um, we might fall into a trap when we think about overseers. If, if you're working for a company, Steve, how many levels of management were there in West Coast when you worked there? Owner, and then you had the buyers of the different divisions, and then you had somebody who handled the, the 
Okay, so there were, and each one of those people were responsible for their own division, right? Everyone except one. Didn't own the company, but they were accountable for their portion. And they were the overseer of that portion. And this means that each one of those individuals had defined responsibilities. We talked about some of those as it refers to shepherd, overseer. Um, question. Does this mean the overseer has the ultimate authority? He isn't the chief shepherd. That's what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. But he is responsible for his own area. And uh, he'll be accountable for the tasks he is given. And that's the reason we look at the tasks. We look at the parts that go with this gift. Um, because those are the areas for which one is responsible. And too often in the church through the centuries, we've gone beyond the simplicity of the instruction manual. In the early church, what happened? They began setting up one group of elders who kind of were over other elders. And then there was the mother church and satellites of that church. And then one elder became more important in the mother church than some of the other elders. And you know what resulted, right? The papacy. Yeah. You ended up with the Pope and the archbishops and the bishops and the cardinals and the robins. And, yeah. And so this is probably one of the more difficult gifts to exercise because it's such a fine line. Always looking to the chief shepherd, knowing the manual inside and out, and not falling into that trap that we would in business. I mean, in business, you tell somebody to do something, and if they don't do it, there are consequences. And okay, you're getting a warning because you didn't get that done. And, and then the next time you get another warning, and maybe the third time, well, you know, you're out of here. Well, it doesn't work that way in the church because you, it's not a you do this or else kind of thing. Now, Scripture tells us that, doesn't it? There are consequences if you do make certain choices. So it's a, it's a difficult gift to exercise and the and, uh, analogy that I was trying to use when I had Steve tell me about Wesco, uh, it kind of breaks down in that respect because there aren't any immediate consequences if someone is asked to do something and they don't do it. I mean, I, they'll have consequences to the chief shepherd. Right, and, and I think it may be Peter, Peter or Paul talks about not making the shepherd's job tough. Don't make it hard by being a stubborn, wandering old sheep. That was another characteristic Greedy had. Well, she was hard-headed. And she, would, she wanted her way. and didn't matter. She would try to push you out of the way. And everybody else too. So, we can also 
we talk about this, okay, this elder's over these elders, and then there's over, and so on. We talk about that. There, we can also get into the mentality that um, an overseer or the elders, corporate, are to be a, uh, a board of directors for the congregation, campus. But we don't really have scripture to back that up. Who is, we, we say, well, who's, who's responsible for making all the decisions for the congregation? Who's the ultimate decision maker? Well, again, we've got to know the guidebook, don't we? Uh, let's go back to the example in scripture of when the first pastors, who were the first pastors? Who were the first overseers? Who were the first elders? Peter was one, yeah. The apostles, right? The apostles. Uh, let's go back to the example in Scripture of when the first pastors began to realize their main responsibilities of shepherding were being compromised by the tugging for their attention of other needs in the church. Andrew, uh, next slide, please. In Acts 6, um, do you have that, Leonard? You want to read that for me? Uh, Acts 6, 1, 2, 3. Yeah, we'll go down to verse, verse 6. And Andrew, you'll want to change that uh, after we will put them in charge of this work. You'll want to change. So Acts 6, 1 through 6. Now at this time, all the disciples were increasing in number. A complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews and of the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily service of food. So the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, It is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The statement found approval with the whole congregation, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, or, or, and these other guys there, yep. and a proselyte from Antioch. And these they brought before the apostles, and after praying, they laid their hands on them. So how how did these men, now they're not called deacons here, I don't think. How did these men become known as the deacon, the official role of deacon? How, how were they chosen? Uh, Who? And who chose them? The congregation chose them. And in verse 3 where it says, brothers choose, that's a, in many translations, that's translated brothers and sisters. That's a, that's a non-gender <coughs> word. Uh, so it's an indicating both. But the overseers... Alan said, go choose, and they, they gave a number, go choose seven men from among yourselves who can take care of this work. And so this group, whoever had approached the apostles, this group went away, got the body together, the body of believers, and chose and came back and said, okay, these are the fellows. So the apostles did not choose. The elders did not choose. They directed the choosing. They oversaw the process. The congregation chose. Why? Because they knew them. They knew them maybe better than, than the apostles because they, they were such a group at that point. I mean, here at this point we're what? Three thousand, five thousand, something like that. And they would have some what we call skin in the game. Okay, uh, we're we're choosing this these folks, and it was for this particular task. 
the task of providing for the widows, providing the food, not waiting on tables, but making sure that the, the all things in common was distributed evenly. Does that make sense? Okay. Might be what? Greek. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Nicholas um, was, it says, and probably uh, Timon, I'm thinking. Nicanor doesn't sound like a Jewish name. Prochorus doesn't sound like a Jewish name. Okay. From this point forward, Whose responsibility was it for the feeding of those in need? Or providing for those in need? Whose responsibility? Right. Right. Not the overseers. Because they, they had given that to these individuals as overseers. I, we have other things to do. This is not what our gift is. You take care of it. Needs to be done. Needs to be done. So, um, whose responsibility was it to find those in need? Those men. Whose responsibility was it to manage the funds to pay for those physical needs of the church? So that we can devote our time to teaching and pray. Those men. Those deacons. Those seven. You'll recall the great effort that Paul put into gathering a gift from churches. Now, this is actually the second gift, the one I'm referring to right now. This is actually the second gift, because there's another one that we're going to refer to in just a moment. Where he was evangelizing, he talks about it in um, 2 Corinthians quite a bit, and that whole area of Asia uh, and Greece that he was in, where he was collecting funds to take to the brothers in need in Jerusalem. It's written about in second, uh, 1 Corinthians 16. It's written about in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We studied about that in our 2 Corinthians study. And Paul spent quite a bit of time talking about this collection to the Corinthian churches, but had also written to other churches, you recall. Uh, I think he mentions Galatia about it. And, and, and then he finally takes the gift to Jerusalem. And he had a number of representatives of various churches who were traveling with him from the contributing churches, accompanying with him <clears throat> to deliver this gift. I think uh, seven are named in Acts 20, verse 4. And we know that Luke was also with them because he was writing Acts. He's not mentioned. There may have been some others who aren't mentioned either. But we know these seven were there. So this is a group who's traveling with Paul. <clears throat> so he spent all this time. He's got a group with him when he goes to Jerusalem. And it's very important to Paul that he handle it correctly. He talked about this to the Corinthians. I don't want to give the wrong impression. And he's got all these people and all these congregations involved in this project. You would think that if he had delivered it to the elders at Jerusalem, that it would have been mentioned when he talks to the elders um, so that they might decide how it was distributed. You would think that Scripture would have said something about that when he met with them in Acts 21, but no. There may be a reason for that. There may not be a reason for that. But we do know that from the point in uh, Acts where the deacons were appointed by the, by the apostles that had been chosen by the congregation, from that point forward, there's only one other mention that I could find where elders are involved at all in handling funds. And that is in, let's turn to Acts 11. Steve, I'm going to have you read um, 
in Acts 11. If you would, please. Verses 25 through 30. Yeah, there was, they have um, been scattered in verse 19. Believers are going different places. Um, Barnabas goes up to Antioch and encourages believers there. And then 25. And he left for Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And it came about that for an entire year they met with the church and taught considerable numbers. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Now at this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them was named Agabus, stood up and began to indicate by the Spirit that there would be certainly a great famine all over the world. And this took place in the reign of Claudius. And in each the proportion that any of the disciples had means, each of them determined to send a contribution for the relief of the brethren living in Judea. And this they did in charge of Barnabas and Saul to the elders. Okay. So, again, the money is brought to the elders, but it's not talked about distribution. And this is the only scripture that I could find that there's even any reference of monies coming to the church and the elders looking, um, taking it in and deciding where it's going to go. I think that the elders were overseeing all this, obviously, because that's what they did, but they didn't make the individual decisions because that was, that was given to specific people to do specific tasks at specific times. Now, when the church was dispersed from Jerusalem, was there any, long, any, any need for these men to function as deacons in that area? We're not told, but we do see Philip going to Samaria, and we see Philip going out into the desert, and Stephen's already been stoned, and we have to assume that there was some dispersal of these individuals filled with the Spirit to other areas to help teach the gospel, spread the gospel. Um, but the point I want to make is the idea that we think that the elders need to be a board of directors for the church puts burdens on them that takes them away from their responsibilities as shepherds. And so... There's talk. nothing wrong with having meetings and sitting down and going over things yeah. and make sure that everybody's on the right page. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't do that, you get off the left field. Yeah. And then it's hard to get back. Yeah. <coughs> okay. The, the reason I'm talking about this is because the decisions about the physical needs of the body is not part of the description because we're talking about the description of these gifts. Not part of the description of what it means to be a shepherd. They're to oversee the spiritual conduct of the flock and the spiritual well-being of the flock. Were they to notice inappropriate use of the funds? Yeah, they're overseers, right? They're required, if that's occurring, as spiritual leaders to step in and say, no, 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 that's not, that's not in accordance with God's will. That's not in the guidebook that we should be doing that with these funds to uh, set up a daycare center. 
from the church fund or you know pull something out of your hat whatever does that make sense okay again it's fine lines fine lines but there's nothing wrong with the daycare no And it, you know, if it's a if it's an evangelistic effort, judgment call, right? So we want to help our shepherds exercise their shepherding gift and everybody else too. If we want to do that, we don't make them general managers of the congregation of the building. Well, it looks like they're. Uh, Something needs to be fixed here. We better go see one of the elders. No. Who's, whose responsibility is it? They've given somebody that responsibility. Right? Um, determining every, where every penny should go. No. They have given people responsibility. You're responsible for, for the missionary work. And you, you need to make sure that the funds <laughs> are appropriately sent in that direction. And that, that's the overseer's role. Does anyone see something I missed in this? Are, are you calling these standard people that were appointed for this task deacons? Yes. Because it refers to uh, one of them as a de Philip the deacon as uh, I think Later, when it talks about the prophet, his daughters prophesied. But, but they didn't necessarily meet the qualifications that are described over in Timothy for deacons. I mean, this is when the church was was an infant. It was just being, and because it was growing, they did have to have people designate people to do certain jobs. How, why do you say they, said, why do you well, say they didn't meet the qualifications? Uh, well, where they were the of course they were reverent, not double tongued, not given too much wine, not greedy for money, but that let them be tested, let them serve as deacons, being found blameless. Likewise, their wives were to be reverent, not slanderers, temperate, faithful in all. We aren't told whether they're married or not, but we have to assume that they were. And what Steve was, I think Steve made the comment, they, the congregation chose them because they knew them. These were men who had been tested, who had this character. Looking at the timeline, the church hadn't been given the qualifications for deacons yet. Yeah. They right. had been given the qualifications for deacons yet. Right. But I'm sure that... No, Paul wasn't an apostle. I wasn't a, an elder. Paul wasn't. We know Peter was. Right. And, and John, um, and yeah, Peter, yeah. And later John. But. What I'm saying is sometimes you have to get a group that's appointed or selected to do a certain task. I see where it's saying, yeah, I see where it's saying. And the reason all of this, they needed more people to do more things and divide up duties was because they were blessed that the church was small. growing so rapidly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Who knows what? Yeah. 
see way beyond what we can see. Right, right. Okay, then you go over to Titus and First Timothy, you know, and Timothy, and you see it laid out, you know, exactly, without a doubt, what they need to be. And this is kind of like the same thing with, okay, you can you can get into this mindset. Okay, show me where they baptized James. Where was James baptized? Where's the scripture that shows that Peter was baptized? Yeah, it's the same same thing. It does, does it matter at this point what we're seeing here? We're looking at, I think your, your whole point in all of this was that the elders saw the overseers at this time, which were, were taught by them as the predecessors or at least at least appear to be overseers at some point. We're looking at and saying, they recognized that they could not fulfill what they saw and were being guided by the Spirit as their duty to do at this time. Right. So they appointed some help. Right. Or they found a way to get help. Now, whether they're deacons or not doesn't matter at this point. I mean, we could, we could argue that. I mean, we're not directly told. We can infer from what appears to be, but mm -hmm. I, don't like to, I don't think it ever uses the language of deacon with these men. But that shows the wisdom. Right. And, and on top of that, we're not left without guidance as things progress. So as the church continues to grow, we're given very good guidance by Paul of what is expected. So either way you look at it, the will is being done, the will of God is being done through the, through the guidance of the Spirit. And we have been provided exactly what we need down through the ages function as God intended the church. Yes. And we know even if they weren't called elders at that point, they're called elders in the passage in Acts 11. They're called elders in the passage in Acts 20. And so, all right. Anything else before we quit today? Where the river meets the road sometimes. Yes. So, we will pick up there next week. I appreciate all the comments and thoughts. And yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was a process in this early uh, first century church, this first decade especially, I'm sure, because, again, the apostles had to lay their hands on people who were going to be prophets the apostles and teachers because there wasn't a text. And so it had to come along rapidly, and I'm sure the Spirit saw that, but there were still steps to get to that point. So, thank you.